everyone. I want to uh, talk to you about a new way of looking at the mind. What I call the extended mind is the idea that the technology we use becomes part of our mind. Extending our minds and indeed ourselves into the world. But I'll start with something that might be a little bit more familiar, the extended body. We're used to the idea that we can extend our bodies with technology. We know about prosthetic limbs. Here's the, the athlete, Oscar Pistorius, running on his prosthetic legs. You don't need prosthetic limbs to extend your body or prosthetic limbs. Blind people say that their, uh, their canes serve as an extension of their body. You know, feels exactly like, like a body from the inside or in more mundane everyday experience. A car can feel like an extension of your body. A bike or indeed a musical instrument. We saw a great illustration of that just a few minutes ago with Jupiter and his didgeridoo is a real extension of his body. Well, so it is with the body, so it is for the extended mind, where technology gets incorporated into our human minds. Now, you might think that to incorporate technology into your mind, you'd have to turn yourself into a cyborg, something like that, a whole bunch of, you know, of, um, pipes and tubes inside your head, or at least need a, whole need a whole bunch of fancy technology like this on your head. But I actually think there's a, more there's a more ordinary kind of mind extension, which is happening to us right now, all the time, um, as we move into the technological future. So take our friend, the iPhone. I've had one of these now for maybe three or four years, and it's basically started taking over a whole bunch of the functions of my brain. <laughs> Things my brain used to do are now done by my iPhone. I mean, there's a million examples. Take memory. I mean, how many people use their brain to remember phone numbers anymore? Not me. You know, my iPhone does all the, uh, does all the work. It used to be the biological memory used to, ha used to carry the load. Now the iPhone is, is carrying the load for me, acting as my memory. The iPhone serves to control planning functions that, used to, that my brain used to do. Spatial navigation, you know, offloaded from my brain into Google Maps. Uh, the iPhone even stores as a repository of my desires. I've got a program on the, uh, on the, uh, the iPhone that, that tells me my favorite dishes at a local restaurant. When we go there, I just look it up and say this, 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 this. This is, the iPhone is controlling my desires for me. It even makes decisions for me. Here's the uh, executive decision maker. <laughs> Am I going to go speak at that TED conference? Oh, definitely. So, um, so okay, you might say, okay, well, this is all a big, uh, big metaphor, and yeah, it's a little bit like a uh, mind in some ways. But I think um, there's actually an interesting philosophical thesis here that I want to defend. That in some sense, the iPhone is literally becoming part of your mind. Your mind is extending from your brain into the world, so the iPhone is actually part of it. I mean, the iPhone hasn't been implanted into your mind, but you might think it's, it's as if it were, here's an iPhone implanted into your mind. It's as if it was implanted into your mind, although it's actually out there in the world. That's the extended mind thesis. So the iPhone's memory is basically my memory. The iPhone's planning or navigation is basically my planning and navigation as if it had happened inside the brain. Now, for me as a philosopher, this is really interesting because one of the central philosophical problems about the mind, maybe the central philosophical problem about the mind, is what we call the mind-brain problem. How does the mind, your thinking and your feeling, relate to your brain, this bunch of mushy neurons you have inside your head? Is it something more? Is it something less? If you ask most people, where is your mind, they'll point and say, well, it's somewhere in there. This extended mind thesis, I think, can sort of transform our vision of the mind by saying, okay, well, the mind is not just in the brain, it's partly in the world around us, in the environment that we interact with. 
Now, I don't know. You might think this is kind of crazy or even uh, totally mad. Um, when my, uh, my, collaborator and I, my collaborator, Andy Clark, and I first put this thesis forward back in the mid-1990s, and you know, we came across a bit of resistance then. A lot of people um, made, made objections. Now, back then, we didn't have iPhones. Um, our central example was a notebook. People writing stuff down in the notebook and using that as a memory. And indeed, you don't need high tech to get the idea of the extended mind going. Um, you know, the very first time, first time somebody counted on their fingers, you know, that was a kind of mind extension, a kind of addition that could have been taking place in your head that's happening on your fingers. But technology really amplifies this extension of our mind. And I think it's made the thesis ring true for more people um, as well, because we experience this actually happening to us. But still, you know, you might object in various ways. You know, this iPhone is just a tool. It's not really part of your mind. For it really to become part of your mind, you'd have to you know, implant it like this. You know, to be in your mind, it's got to be on the inside of your skull. Or maybe it can't be part of your mind. It's metal. Minds, have to, minds are biological. They involve a soul or, or something. No, I think well, it's a tricky issue, but I think this kind of reaction which you get involves a kind of what I call it's like um, it's a kind of brain chauvinism. It's like, you know, uh, gender chauvinism, or race chauvinism, or species chauvinism. What's so special about the brain? I mean, what's so special about the inside of the brain compared to the outside? For a start, you know, it's like, if you've got stuff that's going on on the inside of the brain, the same stuff could, in principle, go on on the outside of the brain. The brain. We want to say no difference in principle, as long as it's driving the processes inside the brain, the action, the consciousness, in the same way that would happen otherwise, there's no principled barrier about the skull. You know, that would be skull chauvinism. Likewise, metal versus, versus biology. You know, if, if, the, if, the, if the metal does the same job the biology is doing, then it also counts as part of the mind. Otherwise, it would be, you know, biology, DNA chauvinism. So I think that's a principled object. That objection, I think, can be rejected. You might think that. Um, Somehow consciousness is at the very center of the mind. And I've got some, some sympathy with this. And that consciousness is this deeply internal state. But I think there's, um, you know, what we're thinking, what we're feeling right in the present moment is at the core of the mind. But there's always a whole lot to our minds which is outside our consciousness. What we think, uh, our innermost desires, our hopes, our fears, our personality traits. A lot of this, most of this is not passing through your mind at any given moment. Any given moment, it's just a tiny little snapshot. What makes you, you? There's a whole bunch of stuff which is outside your consciousness, available to affect it. So your memories are mostly outside your consciousness. And the view here is it doesn't matter whether it's stored somewhere deep in your brain or out there in the world. If it's out there accessible to you, driving your states, then it counts as part of your your mind. I mean, there is still a brain at the core of all this. And I'm not saying the iPhone is itself a mind. You are still the mind with your brain and your consciousness at the core. But the mind is, the iPhone is part of it. It's a kind of extension, if you like. Oh, what was that? Oh, sorry. My iPhone um, begs to differ. It thinks it's the mind and I'm the extension. <laughs> um, so this thesis, I think, is not just, it's a new way of looking at the world, which is kind of cool, a new way of looking at the mind. But I think it actually makes a difference to some of our, um, some of our practices. I mean, in Alzheimer's disease, I mean, people describe themselves as losing their mind. And one thing we found happens, works really well in handling people with Alzheimer's and slowing the decline is the use of mind extension technology. Um, you know, people use notes in the environment, for example, to act as a kind of memory, external memory with labels everywhere. This really serves to, to slow down the, the loss of mental function, keeping you know, some aspect of their mind out there in the world. Um, there are issues about, makes a difference to education. There are debates about open book, soft, um, open book examinations and the use of calculators in exams. Well, if you take the extended mind thesis, you ought to be testing the whole extended self. If a calculator or a computer is going to be with you, coupled with you, reliably available in the future, it is part of your extended self. And you ought to be testing the whole extended self. Um, 
Here's a case of extended perception. Um, a blind person who starts using his iPhone um, as, a, uh, as a vision tool. This is the color, identify, color identification program, Color ID. You can download it. Um, it basically reads out colors. You point it to something, it reads it out. He, uh, he said he used this to see a sunset for the first time. He held it up and it said, you know, went red, orange, yellow, azure, crimson. He was moved to tears. Felt like he was seeing the sunset for the first time using this as an extended vision mechanism, extended perception mechanism. And as wearable computing becomes more and more ubiquitous in our lives, this is just going, I think, to become more and more uh, common. Here we've got glasses that compute stuff for us through extended perception. There's also the, uh, the socially extended mind. We all know where other people get become extensions of your mind. We all know long-term couples where one person acts as another person's memory, you know, reminding them things at the right time, or when they finish each other's sentences, or speak as, you know, single and individual in a conversation. In effect, what's happening now is one person is becoming part of an extension of another person's mind, or vice versa. You know, I'll be in my mind if, I'll be in your mind if you'll be in mine. I think Bob Dylan said that. Um, there's also, um, the social, social networking is really, is really uh, amplifying this. So, um, so uh, when I was preparing this talk about a, uh, about a month ago, I uh, posted out on, uh, sent a note out to, to Facebook. Um, I've got to give a TED talk, 50 minute TED talk in Sydney next month on the extended mind. Any ideas on how to approach it? And I got a whole lot of responses, some pretty, uh, some pretty useful responses from this social network, which is kind of surrounding us, becoming part of our extended mind. There were more, and there were more, and there were more, <laughs> including, I mean, a whole bunch of useful suggestions. I stole a bunch of them. Um, you know, not least of them, this one. Exciting. Maybe you could work Facebook in. <laughs> or, um, well, you could start by mentioning that you crowdsourced the whole talk. Well, thanks, guys. That was, a, that was handy. Now, there are some downsides and dangers to this whole extended mind thesis. I mean, one is that as our minds move into the world, we become more vulnerable to their loss than when they were protected on the inside of the skull. This is already something familiar from um, things like you know, the tragic the floods in, in Queensland or the, uh, the bushfires in Victoria, where we often talk about the greatest tragedy being that people lose their memories. You know, their, their houses and their possessions and so on are basically have become part of them. The loss of them really feels like loss of oneself. And as more of one's mind gets extended, the more there is vulnerability. I mean, just say somebody, uh, somebody steals my iPhone. Um, <laughs> you might think that's a pretty serious, fo that's, a, that's a form of theft, you know, and they should be punished for this. But if I'm right, that should actually be reconceived as a really vicious form of assault. Like, you know, getting into my brain and, you know, messing with my, uh, messing with my neurons. And that really does kind of capture the attitude I have to, to my iPhone. Um, you might worry this is going to turn us into robots. Remember the guy from, uh, from Lost in Space? Danger, Will Robinson. Um, but I think we have to remember, we still always have consciousness at the middle of this and judgment. And the extension of our minds doesn't abnegate us from using um, our judgment. And with better and better technology, which becomes more and more flexible, I think there's the hope that the interplay of judgment and technology might move us forward in interesting ways. So I actually think then, to conclude, the, uh, this extended mind thesis offers us some hope of an optimistic worldview. People say, is Google making us stupid? This is a debate which has been out there in the media. Well, if I'm right about the extended mind thesis, there's a sense in which Google is actually making us smarter. Google is getting inside our minds. And I don't know about, about you, but I heard someone say recently, when I sit down at Google, I feel like my IQ goes up 30 points. <laughs> you know, it's like all that knowledge. And they say, you know, knowledge is power of a kind. So, you know, this I think leads to a kind of potential democratization, too, of the powers of the mind. As technology becomes cheaper and available to more and more advanced, it's going to spread. You know, phones are already spreading. Um, Google is spreading. With time, this becomes available to everyone. So in a way, I think what's going on here is there's a trend, which are in the very early stages of turning us into superheroes, 
of the mind. Technology is gradually giving us these superpowers, turning us into cognitive super geniuses, if you like. And it's just going to go more and more this way in the future. The question is, will we use these powers for good or for evil? That's the, uh, I think that's the, uh, the gift of the extended mind and the challenge it presents as we move into our extended future. Thank you very much.